right, it looks like the, the participant count has, has stabilized. Uh, so let's get started. Um, greetings, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm Galen Barbos with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, welcome to today's webinar where I'll be sharing some highlights from our recent uh, report, uh, status report looking at U.S. renewable portfolio and clean electricity standards. Uh, some of you may know this is a, a recurring report that we've been doing for, for many years now. Uh, we just released the latest edition last week. Um, and one notable change this year is that we expanded the scope uh, to go beyond simply renewable portfolio standards, but to also include the, the growing number of 100% clean electricity standards as well. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more later about what exactly is included uh, in each of those, those sets. Uh, before getting started, though, I did want to just cover a few basic housekeeping items. Uh, so the first is I just wanted to draw your attention to the web address listed on the title slide here, rps.lbl.gov. Uh, this is the website where you can find a copy of the report. Uh, as well as a variety of supporting data files and, and spreadsheets. And I'll say a little bit more later about exactly what is available there. Um, we will also be posting a recording of this webinar uh, at, at that website. So if you want to take another pass um, or have to leave early, um, that will be posted as well in the coming days. Um, just to anticipate a question that always comes up, um, in this case, no, we will not be posting the slides from this webinar. Um, and the reason is that the, the report itself is a slide deck, um, and the slides I'll be presenting today are basically identical to the report itself, though I did move a number of the slides to the appendix just in the interest of trying to get, get to the end within the time allotted. Um, then I think lastly, I just wanted to uh, mention that we will have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, you should all hopefully see a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. So please do enter questions as we go through. Um, I'm hoping we'll have at least 15 or 20 minutes at the end. Um, I am sort of driving this whole process on my own, so um, I won't be able to respond to questions as we go, but uh, I'll kind of look them over in real time uh, during the Q&A session, and we'll, we'll get to as many as I can. Uh, so with that, let's begin. Uh, so first, um, we'll just, I, I wanted to provide a little bit more specificity in terms of the scope of the report and a set of policies that we're covering. So the report covers, as I mentioned, renewable portfolio standards and clean electricity standards. Uh, probably all of you are already familiar with an RPS, um, but uh, for those that they may not be, this refers to some sort of binding requirement placed on retail electricity suppliers to provide some minimum percentage of their load uh, with eligible sources of renewable electricity. Um, we've also this year, as I mentioned, included clean electricity standards. Uh, so uh, those policies are, are similar to an RPS. The fundamental difference is just that they are based on a broader set of eligible technologies, um, often kind of any, any low carbon or zero carbon uh, resource will qualify. Uh, the other difference that, um, is not really fundamental to these policies, but was just sort of a practical uh, decision that we had to make for, for this report is that uh, many of the CES policies I'll be referring to um, may or may not be binding in the same sense that RPS policies are. And part of the reason for that is just that these CES policies are still in their infancy and many of the implementation and enforcement mechanisms are still being worked out. Um, and so ultimately, some, some of these policies may, may not end up having that same uh, level of, of kind of enforcement as RPSs do. Um, we've also included within our definition of CES policies what often might be referred to instead as electric se sector emission standards. Um, and the main difference there is that rather than specifying a target based on a percentage of load or percentage of generation, instead, those emission standards are are specified in terms of a percent reduction in the electric sector emissions relative to some, some baseline year. Um, also, just to be clear about what is excluded from this report, so we've excluded um, any economy-wide carbon reduction targets without an electric sector specific portion. Um, 
We've also excluded any targets that uh, were adopted voluntarily by utilities or by individual corporations, uh, as well as targets that were established only via executive order, uh, but not, not by statute. Um, and then last, we, we've excluded any RPSs or CESs that have been enacted at, by U.S. territories. Um, none of this is to say that those policies aren't important, but just um, given the kinds of information and, and data that we were collecting for this report, um, this was sort of a, a logical uh, way to, to draw the line. Uh, so first, let's just review quickly kind of the, the prevalence of RPS and CES programs and, and say a little bit about how they've evolved over time. Uh, so the map here shows uh, the states with uh, existing RPS programs. There are 29 states uh, in all, uh, plus the District of Columbia, so 30 jurisdictions. Um, those policies differ from one another in many important ways. Um, what this map homes in on, though, is, is the ultimate target level uh, in each of those states. And um, we'll talk more about this later, but you can just see initially that those, those percentage targets can vary widely. Uh, many states have targets that are below 25% uh, of retail sales, but then there are also many others that have much, much more stringent target levels, you know, 50% all the way up to 100% or more. Um, and collectively, the, those RPS policies cover a little over half, 58% of, of all retail electricity sales. Uh, in the U.S. Um, in addition to those RPS policies, there are 15 states that have established some broader 100% clean electricity standard. Um, you can see those here. And um, the key thing to note is that in, in almost all of those cases, these are states that also have an RPS. And so even if the CES and RPS are kind of technically separate policies, um, the RPS in practice sort of functions as a, a subset of the, the broader and, and higher target uh, CES. Um, here we can see a little bit of uh, sort of how these policies have, have evolved and, and come online over time. So above the timeline here, we show the year in which uh, each RPS or CES was enacted. For the RPS policies shown in blue, you can see most of those have been around for quite a long time, at least a decade or more <clears throat> in almost all cases. Um, the CES policies, by contrast, are, are much more recent. Most of those have been enacted just within the past five years. Um, and then below the, the timeline, we show uh, which states in each year made some uh, relatively major or significant revision to, to their RPS or CES policies. Um, and in many of those cases, those major revisions involved some upward adjustment in, in the RPS target level. Um, you can see here also that just looking at the past couple of years, um, it's been a little bit light uh, in terms of uh, major legislative revisions. Um, this next slide here provides a little bit more detail on those recent legislative uh, changes. And so the table on the upper left-hand side just summarizes the number of, of RPS or CES related bills that were um, uh, introduced as well as enacted uh, in the, over the past year and a half. Um, of those that were enacted, um, four uh, were uh, served to strengthen the existing RPS or CES, and all of the others were kind of involved some relatively neutral or kind of technical change to the program. Um, the, the four cases where states strengthened their RPS or, or CES, uh, those are listed in the text box on the right-hand side, um, and that includes three states, Connecticut, Hawaii, and Rhode Island, that either raised their RPS to 100% or created a new 100% CES. Um, and then Ho Hawaii is the fourth of those, and in their case, they made what would on its surface seem to be a, a just sort of a, a technical change to the RPS related to the way that the target is calculated. But in practice, that, that technical change uh, resulted in a, in a rather significant increase in the stringency of the RPS. Um, so with that, let's, let's now talk a little bit about how these policies have impacted renewable development historically. Um, and just as a kind of preface to that, it's important to Note that there are, you know, a whole variety of different market and policy factors that contribute to renewable growth in the U.S. And um, it's 
challenging, if not impossible, to precisely and definitively um, parse out the impact of RPS and CES programs alone. And so the, the analysis that we'll present here should in no way be interpreted as a strict attribution, but really is just in, in, intends to provide kind of a first order estimate um, to help provide some, some sort of rough sense of the relative impact of these, these policies over time. Uh, so there are a couple of way, different ways of, of doing that. <clears throat> uh, first, we can just compare actual growth in uh, non-hydro renewable electricity since the year 2000, that's the red line, uh, compared to the minimum amount of growth that uh, would have needed to happen simply to meet RPS targets over that time frame. That's the blue line there. Um, and just comparing the, the kind of the 2022 values for those two lines, uh, you can see that that minimum kind of RPS requirement equates to a little bit less than half, 44%. Of, of the total renewable energy growth that's happened over that time. Um, obviously, some of that growth would have happened even in the absence of RPS policies, um, but at the same time, RPS policies have, have certainly had some kind of spillover effects um, by, you know, really kind of creating the conditions under which renewable development has, has been able to flourish even outside of those requirements. So this just kind of, again, speaks to the challenge of attribution. Um, that growth outside of RPS programs consists, you know, really largely of three different categories. Uh, there's voluntary utility procurement, so utilities that are, that don't have any RPS obligation, but are nevertheless uh, purchasing or building renewable energy. Um, often uh, as a result of some sort of IRP process. There's a lot of net metered PV, uh, particularly in the, the Western US that isn't counted towards RPS policies and so isn't part of that, that blue line there. Um, and then lastly, there's quite a bit of, of voluntary green power market activity, including corporate PPAs and, and green power programs and we'll talk a little bit more about that on a later slide, um, but I would just note here uh, that that la last category isn't necessarily mutually exclusive with RPS programs in that um, the renewable energy certificates associated with projects that are selling, uh, particularly under corporate PPAs, um, those renewable energy certificates, in, in many cases, do actually make their way into RPS compliance markets. And so those two categories, uh, they, they can overlap uh, to, to a certain degree. Um, so that last figure that we were looking at sort of presented data at a national level, we can also break that down uh, at a regional level, uh, which we've done here. Uh, the same data, so looking at actual growth and renewable generation compared to the minimum amount required for RPS compliance, um, and, and we, we've done that here for the six different regions shown. And the, the purpose of this is just to kind of illustrate how the importance or significance of RPS programs can vary quite a bit from region to region. Um, in particular, you see on the left-hand side uh, in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions, um, actual uh, growth in renewable generation is below the, the minimum requirements. And so that is suggestive of, of RPS programs in those states as most likely having played a relatively significant role in, in the growth that has occurred. Uh, in contrast, you can look at this, the regions on the right-hand side, Texas, the Midwest, and the Southeast, where renewable growth has far outpaced um, the, the minimum amount required in order to meet the RPS. And that then is suggestive of the fact that you know, RPS programs, even if they have played a role, clearly there is a, a, a significant amount of demand for renewable energy outside of RPS requirements in, in those regions. Um, and then the West kind of sits somewhere in the middle between those, those two ends. Um, so another way that we can kind of gauge the historical impact of RPS programs is uh, to do so on a, on a capacity basis by looking at projects uh, installed each year and making some inferences in many cases about whether the renewable energy certificates from those projects is ultimately being used for RPS compliance. Um, the, the first step in that process involves identifying the off taker. So who's buying the power 
from, from each project. Um, and that, that sort of intermediate step may be of interest just in and of itself. And so uh, I wanted to share that the results of that, that initial step here, um, where you can see we, we kind of classified the off takers into these four different groups. Um, utilities and power marketers are the, the largest group in terms of, of off taker types. Um, but you can also see that some of the other categories, namely retail off takers, which include corporate PPAs and community solar, as well as uh, behind the meter on-site projects, have both become much more significant in terms of their share of new builds uh, in recent years. Um, so then kind of the, the final outcome of this whole process, uh, as I mentioned, involves uh, making some inferences about whether the renewable energy certificates are ultimately being used for RPS compliance. The figure here shows the outcome of that of that process um, where we show in each year what portion of the capacity built is flowing into RPS markets versus um, everything else, the non-RPS portion. Um, and then I, I would mostly just kind of draw your attention initially to the red line, which shows the RPS percentage of the total. Um, and there you can see that the RPS portion of new renewable builds um, has been declining over time pretty steadily from you know, 60 to 70 percent of the annual totals in the earlier years to 30 percent uh, last year in 2022. Um, and that's happening uh, despite the fact that the RPS capacity additions in an absolute sense are actually growing somewhat over time. Uh, but re really what's going on here, and so what's sort of driving the trends is that the non-RPS portion is growing even faster. Uh, and that's why the, the RPS percentage, the red line, it has been declining over time. And that non-RPS portion, um, it, it consists of kind of the three different subcategories that I mentioned before. Um, looking at just 2022, the largest portion of that non-RPS portion uh, is utility and power marketers who are outside of RPS states, but are still buying a, a lot of renewable energy. Um, and are driving a lot of the new builds in those states. And most of that is in Texas and the Midwest and the Southeast. Um, there's also, as I mentioned, quite a bit of on-site solar that's, that is being built outside of RPS programs. That was the, the second largest share of the non-RPS portion. And then corporate PPAs and community solar um, were also a relatively large share. Um, so with that, let's kind of turn our attention towards the future. <clears throat> and look at um, kind of what, what impact in terms of new renewable capacity and generation these uh, RPS and CES programs might require going forward. Um, so first, uh, I wanted to just present some data, just looking at the target levels and percentage terms. So um, the, the figure here, it shows for each state, the final percentage target level along the y-axis and the, the final target year uh, along the x-axis. And so just focusing first on the RPS targets, the blue circles, uh, it's helpful to uh, sort of parse those out into three different sets. Uh, in the lower left-hand quadrant of the, of the chart, you've got kind of the set of, of legacy RPS programs. So these are states with relatively low targets, um, typically in the kind of 15 to 20, 25 percent range, um, and with target years between 2015 and 2025. So many, many of these states have already passed their, their final target year or maximum target year. Um, you then, the, the second contingent uh, consists of states in the center of the chart. These are states with um, much higher RPS targets, typically at least 50 percent or more, um, and, and with final target years in or around the year 2030. Um, and then last, you have uh, kind of a scattered contingent of states with similarly, similarly high targets, um, but longer timeframes you know, out in the 2040 to 2050 range. Um, most of the states, uh, the RPS states in those latter two groups um, have also adopted uh, even higher and, and even longer term CES targets. Um, those, those are denoted by the, the dashed lines. Um, those are the RPS states that also have a CES. 
And then, of course, the CES targets in those states are shown in yellow. And you can see that most of those targets don't really um, hit their, their maximum year until 2040 to 2050. Uh, the next slide here provides a little bit more detail on the timelines for these CES targets. Um, and so the figure here, which um, takes maybe a, a little bit to, of effort to digest, um, what it shows is, is the time period over which the CES policies ramp up. Um, so this is just focusing on, on the 15 states with, with a CES. Um, and there are a couple key key points to note here. Um, first is that most of these CES targets don't really commence or come into force until after uh, many years, in, in many cases, uh, many years after the ultimate RPS target year, uh, which is shown by the blue bars. And so there is sort of this, this gap that can exist between um, when the RPS hits its final maximum percentage target and when the, the CES targets begin kicking in. Um, another important point is that um, unlike RPS policies, which typically have kind of relatively smooth ramp ups in the target each year, the CES targets um, typically don't have any sort of ramp up. Um, they will either consist of just a bookend set of targets, so kind of an early year target and a final year target without any specified ramp up in the intervening years, or in some cases, um, they have just a single distant year target without any prior year targets. Those and those are the, the five states where there's just kind of this relatively narrow uh, yellow bar. Um, in addition, many of the CES states have different target timeframes depending on the utility or the utility type. So there might be kind of a, a, a an earlier target CES target for larger utilities and a later target for smaller or publicly owned utilities. So putting this all together, the figure here shows a projection of RPS and CES requirements or, or demand over time. So this represents the total amount of renewable electricity or renewable electricity certificates that are required in each year to meet the RPS and CES targets in, in that year. Um, and so you can see just focusing initially on the RPS portion that, that RPS demand uh, roughly doubles, a little bit more than doubles from 400 to 900 terawatt hours um, between the present day and, and 2050. Um, those RPS targets, they do taper off, or the RPS demand tapers off uh, a bit starting in the year 2030. And that is just due to the fact that many, year, many states hit that maximum RPS target year in 2030. The CES targets then really largely pick up a lot of that slack um, in years following 2030. Um, the CES uh, targets or demand uh, are relatively lumpy, as you can see this kind of choppy shape to the, the yellow segment. Um, and that just reflects the structure of the targets and the timelines of the targets that we were talking about on the last slide. The actual growth in, in new supply will, you know, would most certainly be smoother than, than the demand requirements. Um, I'd also just kind of remind you of this point I made at the outset that these CES targets may or may not be binding in the same manner as the RPS policies. And so the, the demand shown for CES is, is maybe a little bit more uncertain or fuzzy than what we're showing for the RPS targets. Um, and then lastly, just note that this increase in demand does not directly equate to the required increase in supply which brings us to the next slide where we've actually tried to estimate how much new supply is actually needed in order to meet these increasing levels of, of demand. Um, and so what we've done here is just break up the total demand for both RPSs and CESs into the portion that uh, could be met with existing resources that are online uh, as of the end of 2022 versus new resources that would need to be built uh, between, you know, at some point in, in the future. Um, and you can see that roughly half of total demand um, will need to, will require some new resource build. Um, and that's true both in aggregate as well as individually for RPS and CES programs. Um, one key point to note though for the CES portion is that most of that existing resource contribution 
consists of existing nuclear and large hydro that is eligible or will be eligible um, under, under CES policies. Um, there are a couple important factors that we haven't captured here, um, which would impact the amount of new resources that are required. Um, the first is that we haven't looked considered retirements of uh, existing RPS or CES resources. Um, and in the case of CES, uh, existing CES resources, really largely what that comes down to is um, whether existing hydro and nuclear facilities are, are relicensed. And so to the extent that there is, you know, there are retirements or failures to relicense facilities, um, that obviously would, would increase new resource needs beyond what we've shown here. Um, in contrast, though, we haven't considered the possibility of new interregional transmission, which may unlock uh, existing renewable and clean electricity supplies to contribute to RPS and CES policies in adjacent regions. And so um, the you know, new interregional transmission could then um, potentially reduce the amount of new resource build that's, that's needed for these policies. Um, here we're just kind of diving into two particular regions, the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, and we are comparing the total amount of new supply needs for RPSs and CES uh, policies in those regions to the amount that is required solely through either offshore wind targets, which have been adopted in many of those states, as well as any solar or distributed generation carve-outs that have been uh, adopted in those states. Um, and the key point to note here, particularly with respect to the offshore wind uh, targets, is that those potentially meet a very large share of the new uh, uh, new clean energy supply needs in those regions. Um, but as you can see, you know, those targets are, are quite lumpy. Um, and so um, the actual amount of new supply needs is, is quite dependent on the pace and timing of when new offshore wind projects come online. Um, and in particular, you know, a relatively slow pace in offshore wind development could create uh, relatively large near-term residual supply needs. Um, and with that, the possibility for kind of large swings in the amount of uh, uh, sort of residual renewables that are needed and correspondingly large swings in uh, renewables energy certificate pricing. Um, and then lastly, within this section, we wanted to just kind of provide some context around the amount of new supply needed to meet RPS and CES programs by comparing those uh, new build requirements to the total amount of, of new renewable electricity that um, EIA is projecting uh, in the most recent annual energy outlook. Um, and so the, the new builds for RPS and CES uh, are shown by the heavier dashed line on the bottom where you can see those policies collectively require that uh, non-hydro renewable generation increases from about 17% today to about 28% of the US total out in 2050. Um, in comparison, the EIA's reference case projects that renewables, uh, non-hydro renewables would reach 57% um, of, of total US generation by that year. So clearly a lot of, of renewable development that's projected to happen outside of RPS programs uh, and CES programs. Uh, those programs represent maybe about a quarter or so of the EIA reference case new builds, um, but there's certainly a lot of uncertainty around um, what the, the total amount of, of new builds that might happen, um, and, and that helps to illustrate how RPSs and CESs, they provide some, some kind of heads value against that broader market uncertainty uh, in, in new renewable energy development. Um, so here I want to talk very quickly about kind of compliance results and basically how, how well states have done in hitting their RPS targets to date. Uh, so the first figure here, um, it is based on the most recent compliance year data in each state. So typically 2021 or 2022. Um, and the height of the bars of the stacked bars show the total RPS percentage requirement for each state in, in the year shown. Um, and then of that total requirement, um, what was the, the shortfall in terms of uh, re retirements? 
Um, and basically, you can see that you know most most states have have you know fully met or or almost fully met their RPS requirements uh, in these most recent years. There are some small shortfalls that are evident in a number of states. Um, there's also a relatively large shortfall in in one particular state, Illinois, that just kind of reflects some some transitional issues there related to a relatively massive um, change in their RPS policy. Um, in 2021, um, but but most states are are as I mentioned hitting their targets and, and in many cases are are well ahead of their schedule, um, in part by relying on on kind of large stockpiles of banked recs from previous years, um, which in some states are are dwindling. Um, here we show similar sort of figure, but just focusing on any solar or DG carve out that may be part of the RPS. Here again, you can see generally high levels of compliance. So there were four states that that um, uh, were short uh, in in the most recent year, often due to some relatively kind of state specific issue. Um, and so this brings us now to the the last section of the presentation, uh, where we look at rec pricing trends and and RPS compliance costs. Um, so first, we'll just look at some rec pricing data. So rec prices are, are important from a couple different perspectives. Um, they're important from a compliance cost perspective because, at least in some states, recs are the primary driver for, for compliance costs. And so understanding what's happening with rec prices is kind of a, an important precursor to, to looking at compliance costs uh, in those states. Um, but they're also um, separate from that and an important indicator of kind of the supply demand balance um, in, in each state um, where, you know, tight markets with, with tight supplies um, will have relatively high uh, rec prices often at or approaching the alternative compliance payment levels in those states. Um, so with that little bit of background here, let's just, uh, I'll, I'll say a few things about the figures here. So we, we again are showing uh, two regions, New England and the Mid-Atlantic region. These are where kind of rec pricing is, is most liquid and where um, the most uh, sort of uh, RPS compliance relies most heavily on unbundled renewable energy certificates. Uh, so in the, in the top chart, uh, uh, New England, you can see that uh, rec pricing uh, has been relatively stable over the last few years in most states, uh, hovering around $40 a megawatt hour, which is is just below the ACP rate um, in, in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And so that that signals that uh, rec supplies in those states are, are relatively tight. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic uh, region or PJM, um, the, the market there, the rec market there is, is sort of bifurcated. You've got uh, a number of states with relatively low rec prices, and then another set, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware, that have higher prices and, and where rec prices in those states are, are basically coupled. Um, and so you can't actually distinguish the lines for those for the for, for those four states from from one another. Um, but in, in those four higher price states, you can see that rec prices have been increasing steadily. Um, they ended the, the year last year at about $30 per megawatt hour, which is essentially an all-time high. Um, and that is an indication of the tightening supplies in those states. And, and that tightening of supply is itself a function of relatively slow development, um, in part due to interconnection delays. Um, and as a result, um, the, the bank of RECs that states in those uh, that those states have been relying on, that that REC bank has been diminishing quite rapidly. And so, even though prices aren't yet at ACP levels in those states, they're they're approaching that level, and most certainly will will reach it, barring some um, important change in either supply or demand. Um, the figure here focuses on REC prices for solar carve out. So these are S REC prices. Uh, for states uh, with, with uh, solar carve-outs and that rely on unbundled RECs. Um, the, the pricing here varies quite a bit from state to state, so there's not that same kind of coupling that exists when looking at primary tier RECs as we were on the last slide. Um, 
The main point I think to note, well, it's twofold. First, that, that prices in most states is relatively stable. We haven't seen kind of any major shifts uh, in the last few years. Um, but more importantly, is just to note that um, pricing levels vary quite a bit across states. And in particular, there are three states, uh, DC, uh, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, with quite high SREC prices in the you know, 200 to $400 range. Um, and that, that is important uh, as we get to the next slide here, where we show compliance costs. Um, and so here we're focusing uh, again on compliance costs for the most recent year with available data, uh, in most cases, 2022. Um, and we've we've broken out the states into two groups, the, the chart on the left and the chart on the right. Uh, the chart on the left focuses on retail choice states where compliance is happening primarily through purchasing and retiring unbundled RECT um, uh, and where the compliance costs are primarily based on uh, RECT prices uh, in those, those states as well as ACP rates. Um, and as you can see, in those states, um, there's quite a bit of variation uh, in compliance costs. We denominate compliance costs here as a percentage of average retail electricity bill. So you can also think about this as being uh, a rate impact, um, though for a variety of reasons, it's, it's not really a precise measure of rate impact, but uh, sort of a proxy. Um, and you can see that that, that uh, compliance cost you know, it varies quite a bit from state to state. On average, it's about 3.5% of customer electricity bills. Um, the, the biggest variation, though, you can see is related to the solar and DG carve-outs. Um, and in particular, those three states that I highlighted on the last slide, DC, New Jersey, and Massachusetts, with relatively high SREC prices, are also the states with, with the highest overall RPS compliance cost and, and the overall RPS compliance cost in those states primarily consists of, of the cost associated with meeting those solar carve-outs. Um, so that's, that's certainly, I think, a key takeaway from this slide. Um, you can see also quite a bit of variation, even just in the primary tier compliance costs, and, and that reflects differences in target levels. Um, it reflects differences in um, kind of procurement strategies. Um, among among other factors. Um, this last slide here uh, just presents uh, time trend in total RPS compliance costs for the last few years. Um, again, kind of broken out by state and region uh, as we showed on the last slide. And I think the main takeaway here is that you know compliance costs are are rising in some states, but in many others they're they're holding steady or even declining. Um, there are a couple different drivers for this. So, you know, obviously RPS targets are rising um, and in most states, REC prices are rising as well, or at least holding steady. And so those factors just taken in isolation would tend to result in increasing RPS compliance costs over time. Uh, but at the same time, at least over the past couple of years, um, total renewable electricity, I'm sorry, total retail electricity costs um, have been rising even faster, partly just due to kind of general inflationary pressures um, and the fact that retail electricity prices are increasing across the board um, and, and are doing so at a faster pace than RPS compliance costs. And so for that reason, um, we see kind of flat or declining RPS compliance costs in many states. Um, there's also the fact that, you know, to varying degrees, states rely on long-term contracts I mean, this is particularly the case in, in vertically integrated markets, but, but also to some degree in retail choice states. And those long-term contracts will kind of mute or dampen any year-over-year -year changes in rec prices. Um, and so that, that also creates some, some stability in RPS compliance costs over time. So just to wrap things up with kind of a few overarching statements um, in thinking about uh, the future role and impact of state RPS and CES programs uh, over time. Uh, and so there, there are a number of different factors that are important. Um, you know, first and perhaps foremost is just whether additional states to decide to either increase or extend their RPS targets um, or adopt broader CES targets. As I've mentioned, you know, there are, are 30 jurisdictions with an RPS. Um, 
only half of those have some broader CES. So, you know, potentially there's there's some bandwidth there for further policy evolution and adoption. Um, also important are, you know, what kinds of implementation and enforcement mechanisms are ultimately uh, established for those CES policies. As I mentioned, um, you know, many of those policies, they still haven't, haven't quite yet worked out those details, uh, but those details are certainly very important in terms of what level of impact they will ultimately have in terms of driving new, new renewable development or, or clean electricity development. Um, Federal policy is also increasingly important. Um, obviously, the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law are pivotal uh, policies um, related to, you know, in terms of stimulating new, new renewable development and new transmission development. Um, and so how, how those, those federal policies ultimately pl play out over time will have important implications for how, how well states do in, in meeting their individual targets. Um, there are other complementary efforts at, at the federal, regional, and state, and even local levels related to renewables integration, permitting, transmission, interconnection issues, and so on, that will similarly have important implications for states' ability to, to, to hit their, their RPS and CES targets. Um, Diving further into the weeds, there are then you know lots of kind of nuanced aspects of RPS policy design um, that may be important within individual states. Um, and then last but not least, you know what what happens to renewable energy costs and rec price trajectories over time, and and what that then in turn means to RPS compliance costs and sort of the uh, kind of political uh, stability surrounding you know public support for those policies. Um, so with that, that kind of concludes the presentation. Uh, the full report has some additional material that I didn't get a chance to go over here. So um, if you're hungry for further details, um, I would encourage you to take a look at that full report. Um, but, but I did hopefully kind of cover the, the key essential details. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn to the Q&A now, um, and, and this will be a little bit of a kind of scattershot efforts since I'll be reading these questions for the first time in, in real time. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of go through them more or less in, in chronological order, and we'll do my best to, to get through as many of them as I can. Uh, so first question, can a generator sell renewable electricity out of state to a, a more lucrative market? Uh, the answer to that is yes, um, though any individual RPS has um, geographic uh, and or deliverability requirements that limit the geographical scope of resources that can potentially contribute to, to their individual target. So the, the general answer is yes, but for any individual uh, state, it really depends on, on how those eligibility rules are defined. Uh, next question, can you explain how the voluntary market and RPS markets overlap? Uh, does this mean that energy attributes associated with RPS programs get allocated to voluntary markets? Doesn't that mean that the RPS energy becomes null? So this is this is a, a good question and an important clarification. So um, certainly um, it's not the case that RECs can be double counted. I mean, that's why REC tracking systems exist is to prevent, um, you know, multiple claims on the same REC. So that, that is not certainly not what I was suggesting, but rather that um, in many cases, uh, a corporate entity might purchase uh, the renewable energy and even the RECs from a particular project, um, but then they might ultimately sell those RECs into a compliance market in order to make the, the economics work out. Um, and if they do that, they may purchase some equivalent number of RECs from some lower cost market. And so they, they may still be able to sort of claim a certain level of renewable energy uh, contribution, but the RECs that they're using that support that claim may not be coming from the projects that are, are procured under a long-term PPA. Um, and I, I would just note that this, this is sort of a bit of a, a a black box, um, at least in terms of kind of the public data and what's sort of what's ultimately happening happening to the the RECs under those arrangements. Um, question number three, related to slide twelve, by off taker, do you mean REC purchase only or REC and electricity? So this 
slide I didn't kind of get so the previous question. Um, it, it's, I think th that slide here, which I'll just back up to it, um, is this one here. Um, and I, I hopefully the Q&A box that I'm looking at isn't blocking all of your view of this slide. Um, but the, the slide here uh, where we parsed out renewable capacity additions by year, um, that that kind of parsing, I would say it it really relates to where the power is going. Um, the RECs may be initially flowing with that power, um, but as I mentioned uh, in response to the previous question, um, those RECs may ultimately end up getting retired by some other entity than if they you know initially go to the the uh, off taker of the electricity. Uh, next slide, um, uh, or next question. Slide 10 speaks to the correlation of RPS and CES and driving growth in, in renewable electricity, but does not speak to causation. Uh, it could be posited that the ITC and PTC are more indicative of causation than RPS and CES. Would you please defend your findings? Um, so I, I, I would just, I guess, um, punch on this a little bit by repeating my initial disclaimer, which is that we are not making any claims about attribution. Um, you know, we are, you know, speaking really more to correlation than causation. Um, and even the correlation component is perhaps somewhat provisional. So uh, absolutely, I mean, I agree with the, the question here that the ITC and PTC have been important and, and you know, may have maybe more important, probably certainly are more important in many region, regions um, than RPSs and CESs. So um, I think that's, you know, absolutely true. And really, I think all that we can speak to here is just kind of some um, association, we'll say, rather than causation. Uh, slide 13, <clears> the <throat> next question, slide 13 asks, what steps have been taken to avoid double counting capacity when voluntary markets are interested in electricity and power and RPS markets value RECs? I think the, the main step here is just having um, tracking systems in place that um, are effectively um, you know, guarding against double counting. And, and I'm not an expert in that space. Um, there are others who are much more engaged in sort of the nitty gritty of how these tracking systems function. But I would say my, my general impression is that existing tracking systems do a good job of avoiding double counting. I think where the fuzziness comes into play is sort of how the kind of public pronouncements are made um, and whether, you know, when a company announces that it's, you know, purchasing renewable electricity from a particular facility, whether they're clear about whether or not the RECs associated with that facility are also being retired by the company or whether they're being kind of swapped out for cheaper RECs that are, you know, big source from, you know, Texas or the Midwest. Um, we've got 10 minutes left here. Um, so next question, is there any data or plan to study the amount of megawatts of new renewable electricity that is installed independent of the grid in smaller microgrids, uh, which won't be vulnerable to large scale power outages, blackouts, or the higher cost of upgrading the existing grid? Um, I can't speak to, to plans beyond you know, my research team and the folks that I work with, in, in which case the answer is no, there is no uh, immediate plan to look into that. But certainly that is an important and interesting question. And hopefully um, there are others that are planning on looking at that. Or, and, and it's something that you know, maybe, maybe we should be thinking about as well. Um, that would certainly be outside the scope of this, this RPS report. Um, but but could be you know a really valuable data set uh, to begin thinking about. Um, another question. This is helpful information. Can we get a copy of the slide? So um, as I mentioned about that, we, we're not going to be posting the slides from this webinar, uh, and that's because the report itself, which is available, um, is a slide deck um, and is essentially identical to the slide deck that I presented here. So I, I would encourage you if you're interested in um, getting a, a hard copy or electronic copy of, of the information to just um, download the report itself, which is available at rps.lbl.org.
gov. Uh, does the chart on slide 17 assume that electricity loads will increase over time? So yes, it does. Um, so uh, kind of buried in the footnote under this slide um, is uh, an indication of, of how, uh, a, a indication of the load forecast that underlies this RPS and CES demand forecast. Uh, and specifically, we relied on the most recent EIA annual energy outlook reference case. Um, I should have also mentioned that uh, there are a variety of data um, data tables and, and supporting spreadsheets that we've posted online at rps.lvl.gov. And one of those supporting spreadsheets is the retail sales forecast um, that we use, um, which is, is broken out at the state level. <clears throat> um, next question, have you looked at the impacts of uh, the IRA incentives uh, that, that, that those incentives might have in meeting RPS and CES targets earlier before the incentives expire in 2032. Um, we, we haven't looked at that in any quantitative sense. Um, there certainly, though, have been analyses of um, the impact of the IRA on renewable development. Um, and I think that's an interesting question that we could explore by, by looking at those um, kind of um, th those um, IRA specific analyses that have been done to try to maybe tease out this specific question. Um, next question, thank you for another great report. You're welcome. Uh, the posted Excel file nominal percentage targets has North Carolina, total CES, Duke only at 120% by 2050. How is that possible? Um, good question. Um, so I think the answer there, and I should double check on this, but I, my, my provisional answer is that Duke's CES covers not only its own retail customers, but also its wholesale customers. And so supplying and, and the nominal percentage targets that we present in that spreadsheet refer specifically to percentage of retail load, um, just to provide comparability across the different states and utilities. So I believe that is at least one of the reasons why the target is above 100%. Um, but if the anonymous attendee who sent that email wants to send me an, an email, um, uh, I can uh, follow up on that. Uh, Next question, what does the change from mainly RPS to mainly CES in 2030 mean for renewable developers and incentives to develop wind and solar in particular? Um, so I guess I would say two things uh, in response. Um, the first is maybe just to sort of challenge the premise there, which is that there is a shift to mainly CES. Um, if you look at the, the solid um, portions of the figure here, that represents the new build or, or new, new generation that's needed for RPSs and CESs. And you can see that it's, it's, it's actually still slightly slanted towards RPSs. Um, so um, I would say that you know even beyond 2030, RPSs will be as large, if not a larger driver for new renewable development than CESs. Um, but you know that that sort of fact or premise notwithstanding, um, I don't think that sort of the shift towards CESs necessarily has in and of itself any implement implement implication for wind and solar development in particular. And I say that partly based on the belief or presumption that most of the new resource build for CESs will continue to consist of solar and wind. Um, obviously, there are other resources that in principle um, could be used to meet CESs, other, other zero carbon resources, including um, carbon capture and sequestration. Um, 
you know, green hydrogen that is, you know, produced um, from sources other than solar or wind, um, you know, as well as maybe new hydro or new nuclear. Um, and, you know, there are economic analyses that have been done to try to sort of project out the um, contribution from those other resource types. And I think in general, what those have shown is that wind and solar continue given kind of the economics, even with the IRA, um, that the economics of solar and wind still seem to be kind of the, the best bet among the, the various potential CES eligible resources. Um, others are you know, certainly welcome to offer contrary views there though. Uh, next question, what resources are included in new CES and new RPS resources? So I, I think I, I kind of addressed that. Um, I would just clarify that for this analysis, this report, we haven't made any estimates or projections about what specific technologies will be used, but rather just, you know, in aggregate, what is the total need? And, and of that total need, um, what portion will likely be met by existing resources versus what portion will require some um, new, new resources. Uh, next question, do any of the RPSs require the RECs to be time matched um, or does time of generation matter at all? Um, and I think, I think the answer is no, um, at least at present, but, but that is an area that is you know, getting a lot of interest um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there are states that are, are looking at, at that and, and may introduce some level of time matching uh, in the future. Uh, next, what is your rec price source, particularly for the Mid-Atlantic and PJM region? So we get our rec pricing data from uh, a broker, um, Merrick Spectron. This is, um, you know, proprietary data. Uh, that consists of daily bid ask prices um, for different rec products uh, by state and vintage. Um, and so, you know, we're unfortunately not allowed to share that data. We have to buy it um, under a license. Um, but um, I think there are there are a number of different sources out there, different brokers. Um, I believe Bloomberg New Energy Finance um, and maybe um, uh, FNL um, both may have rec prices data or indices that, that they sell to their subscribers. Uh, do you think the IRA will increase the growth of renewable projects? Uh, that's easy, yes, <laughs> I do. Uh, I think there, there's been quite a bit of analysis um, that has, has shown that quite convincingly. Um, next question, do you have visibility on how many megawatts are contracted on, on all in bundled basis versus rec only basis. Um, we, don't, we don't have that visibility, at least not in any sort of comprehensive way. Um, I think you know, there are some projects that we know to be rec only, um, but in general, I think you know, we assume that, that most of the long-term contracts uh, include um, the power uh, as well. <clears throat> I know that there are some some you know consulting firms and other entities who track um, contracts and projects um, at at sort of a more granular, detailed level, and, and probably have that information. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> oh well, so we're, we're at uh, we're at time here, so I'm going to answer last question, um, and then and we'll uh, say farewell. Uh, so last question. Uh, PJM and FERC have recently changed rules for the queue process. How long do you expect for these changes to impact supply in those markets? I, I don't have a good answer to that. I have colleagues, um, Joe Rand and Will Gorman, among others, who are um, much more engaged in some of those uh, interconnection queue reforms and, and may have some opinions on that. Um, but um, alas, I, I'm not close enough to, to that kind of policy uh, circle to really have an informed opinion. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna say farewell and, and thank all of you for joining. Hopefully this has been uh, a valuable uh, presentation. Um, if I didn't get to your question, uh, my apologies. Uh, do feel free to email me at the email address listed here. If, if I didn't get to your question or if you have additional questions, 
I'm happy to respond. Um, and uh, with that, I will say farewell and I look forward to uh, the, the next webinar when hopefully you're able to join as well. Take care. Bye-bye.